Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be reading from verses 1 to 6. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verses 1 to 6. It's a passage entitled Unity in the Body of Christ. Unity in the Body of Christ. Paul writes. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you are called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Let's come to pray. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you again, Lord, for the wonderful privilege of being able to gather together around your word. Lord, what a wonderful start to a day to be able to study the word of God together. Heavenly Father, may your Holy Spirit Move and take your word and touch every one of our hearts. May your Holy Spirit move up and down the aisles and move amongst the pews. May he look into each and every one of our souls, starting with my own. May you impress your truth upon every one of our hearts and lives, starting with our, my own. And Lord, may you glorify your mighty name. May it be your voice that is heard. May you speak with great power. May you impress these truths upon us and change our hearts, change our lives, and change this church. Lord, for your glory, so that one day we all hear the words to us, well done, good and faithful servants, enter into the joy of your Lord. Lord, we commit all things to you, glorify your name, grow your church here in your kingdom, for Jesus' sake. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Now this morning we come back to basics and we turn to part two in our study of who we are as Christians and what is our purpose in the church. Who we are as Christians and what is our purpose in the church. Or as I said last week, we could entitle it, How to Function in the Body of Christ. How to Function in the Body of Christ. Both are relevant. And I pray that God turns and He speaks to you and I today at where we're at. Now last time we picked up on a very important verse to kickstart ourselves into the subject, and that was 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Do you remember that? The Apostle Paul writes in verse 13, For we are all baptized by what? One spirit into what? One body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we're all given one spirit to drink wine. And we saw from there that at the very moment of our salvation, when we turn around and we recognize John 16, verse 8, where it, say, where it says that we are, we are to recognize our sin, the holiness of God, and the judgment to come, and we turn and repent of our sins, and turning away from them, and we call upon Jesus Christ to be our Lord and our Savior and our God, you and I were then placed by God into the body of Jesus Christ. Wow. That is what being baptized in the Holy Spirit actually means there for you and I, as we saw in verse 13. It doesn't mean a second blessing that some ministers and some churches perhaps teach today in our lives, but rather the work of God's Holy Spirit in your life that takes place at salvation. And that then gives you entrance into the body of Jesus Christ, verse 13. Now the term body, you see it there in verse 13, is synonymous with the concept of the term church. Meaning that at the very moment 
moment of salvation. You might not have gone and signed the church membership book of your local church or a local denomination or whatever it might, it might, might have been. But at that very moment of, in the sight of heaven, you became a member of God's church. Or verse 13, his body. You became a member spiritually. You became a member physically. And we said that this term, the body, is one of the most unique terms in Scripture found for the church of God. The most unique. There are many terms in Scripture for the church of God, such as the flock, the branches, the subjects, the children. But this is the most unique. We also saw that the church of God is not made up of one person, but of many people. People of different nationalities and different languages and different cultures and different ethnic groups. As Paul went and wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, he said, if you look, now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Wow. We then did a study into what salvation actually means. What it means for you and I to go out and live a saved life. And I do encourage you to tune into YouTube or go on the church website and listen to that sermon. We then asked the question, now that we are saved, now that we are in God's church, what does that actually mean? What does it mean to be a part of the Christian church? What does it mean to be within the body of Jesus Christ? And we saw that at the moment of salvation, we become part of Jesus in the truest sense of the word. We become part of Jesus in the truest sense of the word. So that our very identity as people in the sight of God the Father is in Jesus. Just like that of a baby, perhaps in the womb of its mother. In that you don't see the baby. You don't see the baby's personality. You don't see the characteristics of the baby. When you turn and look, you just see the mother. And it is exactly the same with us in Jesus Christ. When you and I are saved and God the Father turns and looks at you and I, He sees you and I in Jesus Christ. We're under the umbrella of Christ. We're within, within the body of Christ. He sees us in His Son. As it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 of God, that He had saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace. Watch this. Which was given us in Christ Jesus. Wow. Isn't that fantastic? And that when God the Father turns and looks from heaven, and He looks at Mark, myself this morning, a God, Habakkuk 1 verse 13, is so infinitely holy that His eyes cannot even look upon evil. He cannot tolerate wrong. He doesn't turn and see Mark with all my failings and all my inadequacies and my sin in life. He doesn't see that. He doesn't see a life of a perfect spiritual disaster at times. Instead, he turns and he looks at Mark and he sees his son, Jesus Christ. One who is so infinitely holy that in coming into this world and dying on the cross and resurrecting and resurrecting, he went and fulfilled all of God's law. All of God's requirements that Mark needed to get into heaven. Wow. What a great God. And so in turn, when God the Father turns and looks at us, He sees you and I as individuals as having fulfilled all His requirements to get into heaven through the Lord Jesus Christ. So that in God the Father's sight, instead of you and I being seen from heaven as a people who keep falling into sin, and we do fall into sin, don't we? Every single day that we live, we let our God down. We constantly fall into sin. Instead of God the Father looking at us and seeing that in our lives, He sees you and I as a people who are dead to sin. He sees you and I as people who are now spiritually alive to God. He sees you and I as a people who are forgiven. He sees you and I as righteous in Jesus Christ. And I went and gave you a list last week, and there are some at the back you can pick up if you didn't get. That is how God the Father sees us in our position in Jesus Christ. But I also gave you another list that tells you and I how we are now to live up to that position in Jesus Christ. In that since you are spiritually alive to God, now go live the life. Since you are dead to sin, do not give sin any more place in your life. And we closed off by saying, 
That is how God the Father sees you and I individually today in Jesus in heaven. And how we live up to that position, how we live up to how God the Father sees us in heaven, that is Christianity. Christianity is not you and I getting up on a Monday morning, saying a little prayer, saying I'm a Christian, maybe reading a chapter of the Bible, and then just living our life any way that we want to live it through the day, and then coming home and praying to the Lord and asking for forgiveness, and then going to sleep. That is not. Christianity is you and I living our life here on earth, measuring, uh, living according to what we are in Jesus Christ as He saved us, and how God the Father sees us in heaven. That's Christianity. But there was one aspect that we didn't go and look at. And that is not only at salvation are we placed within God's church. And in being saved, our spiritual identity is now found in Jesus Christ. And when we live up to our spiritual identity, that is Christianity. But we are also saved, thirdly, are you ready for this? We're also saved to serve Christ on earth in His body, the church. This is our function in being saved. In that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't reach out into yours and my life and save us so that we can just go out and live. He saved you and I so that we go out and serve. That's why He saved us. He didn't save us just to go out and live a Christian life. He saved us to serve. And it's this that I'd like to look at today. Now I've gone and given you a diagram of circles. You should have that diagram when you came in. If you don't, they are at the back and it will be on the wall behind me. But a diagram of circles. And very simply, it shows you and I, in a circle fashion, the organization of the church of God. It shows us that organization. And what you find is that the very center of the church of God is Christ. Do you see that circle? This is God's church. This is not our church. It's not the denomination. It's not under a bishop. This is God's church. And our Lord Jesus is one who rules and He governs His church through what we call today evangelists and pastor teachers. That's how the Lord governs and leads His church, which is the next circle. Do you see that? And the ministry of an evangelist or a pastor teacher is there to equip God's people, <coughs> Christians, spiritually, so that you can then go out and minister your faith. You are being equipped to serve Jesus Christ. You are taught the Word of God. And you, you hear the Word of God. And you come to an understanding of the Word of God under the Spirit of God. And you take that same Word out and you minister it to the world. And when Christians minister, that's that next circle, the body of Christ, the church, is built up. And the result is that God's church grows on earth as it reaches people across the world and people are saved. That's the last circle. And so people come in from the world, they come into the church, and the church has numerical growth. And so that is basically the structure of the Christian church. Now let's just think about this. At the heart of the Christian church is the Spirit of Christ. He is the church's head. Jesus is the head of the church. Not a man, not a pope, but Jesus Christ. As Paul writes, look at Ephesians 4 verse 15. He says... Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Him who is the head. Who is that? That is Christ. From Him the whole body, that's the church, is joined and held together. Wow. And so Christ is the head of the church. And the way that Christ works in the church is through His evangelists and His pastor teachers, just like myself, who are there to equip God's people, uh, like you, to minister to the world. To minister to the world. As Scripture states, look at Ephesians 4 verse 11. Paul writes, It was He, our Lord Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastor teachers. There it is. To do what? What is our purpose as pastor teachers? What is our function? To prepare God's people, that's you, for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Wow! That is the function and the structure of the church. And that is right. In that Jesus Christ is one who, who died for His church. And He works through those whom He has gone and called to serve Him. I'm not doing this as a job. This is not a job to me. This is a calling. God touched my heart. It's a calling. And He calls His pastors. He calls His teachers. He calls His evangelists. 
who minister to God's people with one specific purpose, one specific job description in life, and that is to help God's people, you, to grow spiritually so that God's people then turn and reach out to the world. That's the purpose. To instruct you in the faith so that your knowledge and the word of God grows and God willing under the Holy Spirit you develop a passion and a desire for the teaching of God's word. As it says of the early church, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they, that's the Christians, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's Bible teaching. They're pastors, they're teachers, they devoted themselves. And to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread, that's communion, and to prayer. Verse 46, every day, that's Christians, continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. In other words, they fellowshiped. They connected with one another. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. In other words, as a group of Christians, they reached out to the world. You will never enjoy the favor of people, or even the hostility of people, but you'll never enjoy the favor of people if they don't know about you. They enjoyed the favor because they were touching people's lives. And people saw the genuineness of the faith that they were propagating and that they were speaking about. And what was the result? End of the verse. And the Lord added to their number those that were being saved. As they touched the world, people looked at them with favor and God grew the church. The church grew. That is God's business plan. That is the only way in heaven that God has actually planned to grow His church. And if you think about it, that is something that makes perfect practical sense, doesn't it? And that it's not necessarily the area that will make a church grow. Sometimes it can touch it, but it doesn't. But what does cause growth is the want of a worldly term, the product. The product. And that is a changed lifestyle. A testimony from the people or the customers of the church about how great God is. How God changed my life. What Jesus Christ has done in my life. It's that personal testimony where we go out and we share who our Jesus actually is. And the word spreads. That's why we know about and buy the things that we actually buy in daily life. Because on television, on the radio, on, on YouTube, there are constantly people turning around and giving testimony about how good product was by comparison to some other product. And we hear that advert and it catches our interest and we might need that type of thing and we go out and buy it. Because there's that personal testimony and that is God's plan for His Christian church. That there is a life of personal testimony, personal witness about what Jesus Christ has done for us and who Jesus actually is. It's not something we just say, it's something we mean from our heart. And certainly if you think about it, how many people does each person here come into contact with in the week? Far more than I do. Who are mentally, emotionally and spiritually battling today. And that's our world. Everybody is battling. Everybody is almost facing a crisis. There's not many people who are just cruising through life without any difficulty whatsoever. Everybody's got some emotional problem that might have hit them or some issue in their life. People who are facing loss or perhaps they have gone and faced loss. People who are searching for God in life. They're searching for meaning. They're searching for understanding. They're searching for something. And sometimes they don't even know what they're searching for. But they are searching and we know what the answer is. People who are lonely in the world. People who do not know Christ. People who are despairing in these difficult times. Maybe they're despairing financially. They're despairing in their work environment. They're despairing with their children or their homes. And you come into contact with them far more than I do. Because that is the makeup of the world and the people around us today. And it doesn't matter the age. Everybody needs Jesus. The old, the middle aged and the young. Everybody needs Jesus Christ. It's not a case of just focusing on the young as so often it's propagated. Uh, in life. We need to focus on everybody. We need to reach who we can reach and not who we cannot reach. We reach everybody. Everybody's got an appointment with Jesus Christ one day. Everybody. Think of it this way. 
If each person in the body of Jesus Christ witnessed their faith on the greatness of our great God, on the wonders of Jesus Christ, and of how God through Jesus Christ has gone and changed our lives, how He's given us meaning and purpose and fulfillment and direction in our life, and we witnessed it to everyone, because it's true, Jesus has changed my life. The mark that was and the mark that has become over the years of ministry and even before that, it's a change. He's changed. He's a great God. And if we witness that faith to absolutely everyone we came into contact with, from the moment we get up in the morning to the moment we go to sleep at night, and we turned and we invited everyone that we come into contact with to church, witnessing to them all, whoever that person is in life, praying for them, caring for them, showing the love of Christ to them, showing God's love. And one person out of everybody that we witnessed our faith to, one family was touched by the Spirit of God. And they came to church, whether you picked them up, whether they came on their own, and they came under the teaching of God's teachers and God's evangelists, and they came to know Jesus as their Lord and their Savior and their God, and their lives were changed. And they went out and they ministered to others. And other lives were changed. And they came into the Christian church. Do you see how the church of God would be built up and would grow to the glory of God? Wow. Can you imagine how such a witness would change our world and the church of God across the world today? How it would change our country that we are praying for. How it would change our, 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 the, the people we deal with. How it would change Boxburg. As you actively share your faith, your testimony, and are determined to do so. And as each person in each department of the church strive for excellence in their department to the glory of God. In Matthew 28 verse 19, our Lord Jesus said of his body, the church, he said, therefore go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do everything that I have commanded you. You say, hold on a moment, Lord, just hold on a moment. I'm actually too scared to go and witness my faith to others. I'm too scared to tell them how Jesus has changed my life. I'm too scared to tell them that I know Jesus Christ. I'm too scared to tell them that I have a relationship with God. I'm too scared to let people know that God has affected my life in a powerful way. I'm too scared to give a testimony about that. I don't know if I've got the courage, Lord, to tell somebody else that I love Jesus Christ. Well, in Matthew 28, verse 20, Jesus said, And surely... I am with you always to the very ends of the age. You see, when we obey Christ and we share our testimony with others from our own hearts, the truth about who my Jesus actually is and what Jesus has done for us, He is with us. Surely I am with you always to the very ends of the age. God changes hearts and He changes lives. We need to testify. We need to share our faith faithfully with other people. And God then does the work. John Wesley turned around in the 1800s, a great preacher, and he said, Give me a hundred men who fear nothing but God, who hate nothing but sin, who know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and I will shape the world. Where are those people today who fear nothing but God? Where are those today who fear nothing but God? Where are those today who fear and hate nothing but sin? Where are those today who know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Where are those who are reaching out and shaking their work and shaking their neighborhoods and shaking their nation and shaking their world for God? We need to turn around and we need to ask God to give us a voice to take every opportunity that He gives us and to reach out for the glory of Jesus Christ 
and step forward for God. For when Christians rise up and we minister for the Lord, the church, the body is built up and it grows and people's lives are saved. And you know that this all starts when Christians start to live up to their position in Jesus Christ. For when our spiritual growth on earth here matches our life as God sees you in Jesus Christ in heaven, we will be a people who will be on fire for God and you will not keep your mouth quiet for the gospel of Christ. When our life matches up to who we are in Jesus. And that form I gave you last week, so important, read it again. When our life matches up to that, you will be unstoppable in speaking for the glory of God here on this earth. For our obedience in life to Jesus Christ now gives us a boldness for God to others and a love for His name and a love for His church. And where there is disobedience in our lives to our position in Jesus Christ, sin takes away our boldness and our love for His church and the things of God. And instead we start to sit back and we might even find criticisms. And so a Christian's part is to submit to teaching and the leading of God's leaders and go out and minister to the world. To reach out for Jesus Christ. So that the church of God is built up. Let's take it a step further. Look at that other diagram that I went and gave you this morning. That little figure. Do you see that little figure? Now that figure again represents the body of Christ. It represents the church. And we are Christ's body. And every single Christian has a part somewhere within the body of Jesus Christ. You know that? Maybe this morning you turn and you look at that little figure and you imagine this little person standing in front of you and you say, well, I think I'm just a foot. Maybe I'm a toe. Maybe I'm just a hand. Maybe I'm just an ear. That's, that's all I am. I'm not very important in God's church. Oh, yes, you are. Do you know why? Because Jesus came and He died for you. He loved you so much. He chose you in Christ before the world began. Every single Christian is of great value. And that little body there represents all different individuals. The arms, the legs, the feet, the hands, the ears. Every part of us. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12. Look at verse 14. Where we see in this, uh, how, where, that we're all important. What does the Holy Spirit say there? He says, now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. That's you and I. And we all make up the body of Christ, the church. Verse 15. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. Verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. If they are all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts and one body. Wow. We have spiritual gifts that have been given to us by God. The point is, as God's church, we all need one another. I need you. You need me. We need Christ. Right? Now, as we think about the concept of the body, we come to the subject of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Now, maybe you've wondered about spiritual gifts before. In that, within the body of Jesus Christ, the church, there is a diversity of spiritual gifts from God. Even though we're all part of Christ, there are many God-given gifts that God has given to His people within the church. Which means that we relate to one another within the church. We're able to minister to one another back and forth. Back and forth. We're constantly ministering our gifts through those gifts. Look at that diagram. Do you see that body? It's got all these arrows going backwards and forward. That's us ministering our gifts. 
Now, when some of us don't do that in life, in that we don't grow in God's word, the, the word, we're not living up to our position in Jesus Christ, we don't attend church, we don't get involved, we don't use our gifts for God's glory, we don't recognize our obligation to other Christians, we don't pray for others, we don't show care towards others, we're not into, into relating with others uh, within the church of God, we don't fulfill our ministries, what we're doing is ceasing to minister our spiritual gifts to the people of God. And those arrows stop. And what it means for you and I as a church, say here, is that we become crippled. And our testimony to the world stops because God's people aren't doing anything. Nothing is happening there. The lights are on, but there's no movement within the body of Christ. And the church ceases to stop growing. It doesn't grow anymore. And when the world looks at us, we look dead. Stoned in. Nothing's going on here anymore. And God is one who holds you and I, each individually, spiritually accountable for it, because He went and saved you and I to be part of His body, and He saved you and I and went and gave you and I spiritual gifts to act with one another within the church of God. Now, within regards to these gifts from God, there are many of them. And they're listed for us, and I've gone and put them on that sheet for you, so you can go home and look at them at home. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and 1 Peter chapter 4. And they're not exclusive lists. They're not exclusive by any means. But some of these gifts are there for you. And if you look just below that figure that I've gone and given you, you will see that I've listed some of those gifts within the church that God has given us. For example, if you look there, there is the gift of prophecy. The gift of teaching. Tremendous faith. Do you know that's a gift from God? Wisdom. Spiritual knowledge. Distinguishing between spirits. Mercy. Contributing to the needs of others. Caring. That is a gift. Encouragement. Serving. Gifts of healing. Speaking in tongues. Miraculous powers and various other things. And there are many, many others that God went and gave to his church. And the, per the reason that God gave them to his church, these gifts, was that Christians would turn and minister to one another. We would minister and care for one another. And according to God's word, every single Christian has a gift. The moment you were saved by God, God gave you a spiritual gift that you can take and minister within the body of Christ. And you are here to minister that gift to other Christians. And God holds you accountable for that gift, for He gave it to you to use. One day when we come before God as Christians, and it says judgment will begin with the house of God, you and I are not going to be judged according to condemnation, or hell, no, because we are saved in Christ. But we will be judged according to our position in Christ. And that God the Father is going to look, and our Lord's going to look at us, and He's going to say, that is your position, that is who you were in Christ, and you need to look at that list I gave you, and this is how you ought to have been living on earth according to it, in terms of your Christianity. How have you been living? And there is a reward. He's going to look at us, and He's going to say, I gave you a spiritual gift. How have you been using that gift for the glory of my name amongst other Christians? And have you sought to grow my church on the earth? How have you been working in terms of that? Every one of us has a gift. And you are here to that minister that gift. And it will be part of the judgment. As Paul writes, look at 1 Corinthians 12 verse 4. He says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same law. There are different kinds of working, but the same God who works all of them in who? All men. Every single Christian, God is touching and working through. We've all got a gift as God's people, and we're accountable to God for its use in our lives. For example, I might have the gift of teaching and preaching. You might have the gift of encouragement. That's a wonderful gift. We all need encouragement. When last did you encourage me? But that's the point. We should be encouraging one another. Or maybe you've got the gift of mercy to help others. Or maybe you've got the gift of teaching as well. It doesn't mean to say you've only got one gift. God might have blessed you with a few. The point is there are many gifts amongst you and I sitting in this building today. Question. What is a gift? Well, a gift is a God-given channel in your life through which the Holy Spirit can minister to another Christian. It's a God-given channel in your life through which the Holy Spirit can minister to another Christian. 
It's not ministering to the world, it's ministering to Christians. Did you get that? Now in saying that, I need to say to you that a spiritual gift is not a human ability. What writing, poetry, playing a musical instrument, doing woodwork, those are talents, those are not spiritual gifts. For example, your talent might be going out and playing a musical instrument, but your spiritual gift may be compassion. It might be caring for others. You might have a tremendous heart in life to care for somebody else. Every single one of us has a spiritual gift from God given to use the very moment that we came to salvation and the Spirit of God placed us within the body of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. Paul says, All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he gives them to who? Each one, that's all of us, just as he determines. And so God's Holy Spirit determines who gets what in life. We don't earn these gifts. We do not seek them. We do not go on a course to try and get them. God gives us different gifts according to His plan and His purpose in your life as a Christian man or woman. Well, as we come to a close, a challenge for you. In being saved and in being part of Christ's body, are you involved in the body of Christ? Are you witnessing your faith? Are you helping this church to grow as God has called you to according to God's business plan? Are you helping the church to grow? For He will hold you accountable one day. He will hold you accountable for Christ Church Boxburg. He saved us not to live. He saved us to serve. Our life is not here just to amble along. Our life is here to serve to the glory of God. Here's a challenging thought. Who has come to Christ Church, Boxburg, and come to salvation because of you and your testimony in the last five years? Who has come to salvation in the last five years? And further, are you using your gifts for the growth of God's people in the church? For God saved you in Christ. Christ died for you. He blessed you with a gift. He incorporated you into the body of Jesus Christ. Are you using that gift for the growth of God's people in the church? Are you ministering that gift? Or are you holding that gift back and not using it? For God is going to hold you accountable for the gift that He has gone and given you for His glory. And you will be judged by it. Or it may be taken away from you. How are you serving Christ this morning? Let's come to prayer. Perhaps this morning the Lord has touched your heart. Maybe in coming to salvation, you've never got involved in seeking God's church to grow. And maybe God has convicted your heart this morning in that you know that the Lord will hold you accountable one day. And that as you stand before Him with heaven hushed, with the entire congregation and churches of every age watching, your name will be called forth. And you will step forward. And God is going to hold you accountable for how you have lived on earth according to your position in Christ. Doesn't matter what we feel, doesn't matter the issues that we might have had in life, he will say, my son died for you. This is how I've seen you. How does your life on earth measure up? But God's also going to hold us accountable for our spiritual gifts. How we have ministered our gifts to others. How we have used them for the growth of this church. God has given us each a gift unashamedly. To be used for his whole church. Are we holding that gift back? Are we seeking to honor Christ with it? 
Or will the Lord hold us accountable and take away that gift? Just as he gave the one man five talents and the other ten and the other one. And the one was one, he hid it away. Are we seeking to grow the church? How many people have come to salvation in our lives since we have become Christians in the last year, two years, five years, ten years? Whose life has been touched by our lives? Later this morning, God has touched your heart. Won't you just speak to him? There you are, called before all of heaven, while heaven watches in silence. Every angel, every person of every church of every age. Heavenly Father, may we be found faithful. May your name be glorified. May your kingdom be extended. For this life here, and the church is not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about the glory of God. For Jesus' sake. God's people say. Amen. Amen.